Well, my name is Steve McKelvey. I'm the Forest Health Specialist for the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. That's your state agency, and they pay my salary, so I work for you. And my responsibility is the uh, state and private forest. And we have a representative from the Forest Service here, and she is responsible for insect and de disease issues on federal land. So to start with, we're going to talk about bark beetles and um, kind of a nasty looking side up there. It's kind of scary. But uh, that's how it feels uh, when you're a homeowner and you move into the forest and it's beautiful and you're enjoying it and all of a sudden all the trees around you start to die and um, your property values go down and it's not what you expected. It really is take, takes an emotional toll. I've seen some people lose 40, 50 trees, you know, on their lots. They're on almost every tree on their on their property. Very sad. Uh, my background is that I've been kind of working with bark beetles since 1993. Uh, uh, part of that time, I worked with the research branch of the U.S. Forest Service. I also worked with uh, the same team uh, as a summer intern and out of Flagstaff, so I am somewhat familiar with the forest of, of Arizona. Uh, I was in California. Um, during the last drought, and I, I've only been here for a year now, working as a forest health specialist. But I was working with private landowners in California during the major drought they just went through, where we lost 129 million trees. Yeah, it was pretty devastating. Now we got fires, but it's either fires yeah. or beetles. It's one of two. So bark beetles, um, they come in a lot of different sizes. Uh, a lot of people think they're big. And ugly, but if you look at the picture on the right, that's a bark beetle in somebody's hand. We usually describe it as like about the size of a grain of rice. Again, you know, they do vary in sizes and it depends on their species, but uh, that's about the normal size of the, the insect that actually kills these large ponderosa plants, hard to believe. A lot of people mistake uh, these wood borers down at the bottom as being bark beetles. They are not, they are secondary insects that take advantage of now the infested tree or dead tree, whether it's burned, uh, bark beetle infested or drought stressed, and then they will come in and take advantage of the dead tree material. And they will start the uh, decomposition progress, actually, they're very good. So let's kind of just go through uh, a little bit of bark beetle biology here. Uh, let's start at the top. I know it's rather kind of hard to see. This one at the top, it is a dispersing adult bark beetle, and it can be male or female, and it will be out searching for a new host, a new tree. And so it'll be like called the pioneer beetle, or kamikaze beetle, as we will get to later. And once it starts chewing into the tree, it starts emitting pheromones that go out into the air, and all the other beetles of that species can hone in on those specific chemicals and then they will come, they're attracted to it. So they will come and help this pioneer beetle but over, try to overcome these, this tree's defenses. Because the tree does have its own defense, defenses, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And so once they start coming in and they get more and more of these aggregation pheromones, uh, there will come a point when the tree is full. And at that point, the beetles will then switch over to a different pheromone called, uh, it's an anti-aggregation pheromone, and the most common one is called verbenone, and it it's, can be effective with some bark beetles, I mean, uh, as far as saying go away, but some, not so much. Um, so once the beetles are successful getting into the tree, they mate, the females start the galleries, they lay the eggs, the eggs hatch, now you get down to bottom here on the left, the bottom left, the eggs have hatched and started to feed the larvae. And now you see it's turning blue. Well, these beetles carry a fungus with them that helps them overcome the tree's defenses. And that fungus is called blue stain, the common name. And so that blue stain now is inoculated into the tree. And as the larvae feed out, and it just gets more and more inoculated with these fungi. And at some point, the larvae reach a stage where, oh, I'm done growing. It's time for me to metamorphize. And so it turns into a pupa, and it sets in this pupal uh, chamber for a while. 
And then that pupa, which is, looks really weird, then turns into this bark beetle. And then it starts all over again. That beetle now is ready to go out and make its own life and find, make a family and start over, just like, just like us. It's just trying to make a living. But it's when they get out of hands when it's a problem. So how do trees defend themselves against bark beetles? Well, they construct these things called resin canals. And when they're healthy and they have adequate moisture, they can construct these resin canals and they fill up full of this very complex compounds and under pressure. So when the bark beetle chews through the outer bark, eventually it's going to chew into and hit one of those resin canals. If it's a healthy tree, it'll push the beetle out. Like I said, it's under pressure. And, and it's also somewhat toxic. So it'll push that beetle out, and you can see by that picture, that's the beetle that didn't make it. And it's just going to stuck in the sap. But if the tree is, is drought stressed or low vigor, growing on a south slope, rocky slope, and not doing so hot to start with, and can't make these resin canals as much as they'd like, and not as much, under as much pressure, well, the attack is successful. You can see it's just a small amount of pitch. And it's a different color. Now it's pink. That means it has reached the phloem tissue. And now that we call that a successful attack. And so when we're out assessing trees, we look for the white pitch and say, yeah, that's, that was unsuccessful. And if we see the pitch tubes that are uh, small and kind of pinkish, we go, well, that tree's got them. So uh, this is uh, all of the bark beetles that like ponderosa pine. I'm going to kind of focus on ponderosa pine because that's the main species of tree that are on your property. Um, and this, this is the west wide list of bark beetles that can kill ponderosa pine throughout its range. Here in Arizona, we have these top ones here are called dendroctinus. They are somewhat the main species throughout the west. Uh, the main one here is dendroctinus brevicomus. It's called the western pine beetle. And that's the one that caused all the damage in the pine forest of California, which I'm going to show you some pictures of. But we have four main species here in Arizona. And we also have these other bark beetles called Ips, and they have a different lifestyle. Ips calligraphus is one of the largest ones. Then we have this Ips canasi, and it's kind of rare, but it's around. Uh, one of the main players, though, is this Ips laconii, is the Arizona five-spined Ips. And another big player in the area is Ips pinei, which is the, called the pine engraver. And it it's, causes a lot of damage. So this is what can happen. This was just two years ago in the central Sierra. We went through five years of drought. And that fourth year was a winter like we had here. No snow is like less than 10% of normal. And that was on top of several other years of drought. So these trees were just put way over the edge. And they just had no defenses for these beetles. And this is what happened. And as you can see, you know, these people moved out into the forest, beautiful lake, and was enjoying it. And all of a sudden now they're just going to have a wasteland. And their property values are going to plummet. And unfortunately, that's, that's just, there was nothing we could do about it. It happened too quick. So this is a typical uh, bark beetle attack by the western pine beetle. The, you see the little pitch tubes are somewhat um, pinkish. And that, that's a sign of a successful attack. And their galleries uh, are the ones, uh, it's kind of hard to see on this small screen, but it kind of looks like spaghetti. What's uh, unusual about this is that, you know, you don't see the larval feeding off the main galleries. And that's what makes these kind of a little bit different. Um, they prefer the larger, older, kind of over mature, what we call ponderosa pine. And the larvae like to feed into that bark tissue and they're hard to find once they get in there um, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack sometimes because that bark is so thick they can be anywhere in that in that region 
and then they'll pupate in their chamber, and then when they're done, they'll, they'll come out and look for another tree. Uh, what's interesting about uh, this lifestyle for the western pine beetle is that being out in the bark, well, it's kind of a target for wood woodpeckers, and we cannot sometimes identify trees from a distance that we know was, was infested by western pine beetle because a lot of the bark had been flaked off the tree. And it looks like somebody just went up there and scraped all the bark off. But it, woodpeckers are good guys. They're eating the larvae for it. We just don't have enough woodpeckers. And last um, is that uh, they can have three generations per year. Now, that's, a, that's the main problem. They typically start you know, in early spring. It was when they, the overwintering population will come out of the tree and start looking for new trees. and by the fall, time fall comes around, they've had three generations. So if the trees are stressed and don't have any defenses, you can see how the populations can basically explode. And that's what we call outbreak. Now there's another, uh, this is the ip species that actually causes most of the mortality here in Arizona, especially around this area in, in the smaller diameter trees. And the way it works is the male initiates the attack and also produces pheromones. He creates a little nuptial chamber and he, he attracts females and they come and they mate and the females then now will make their galleries, lay their eggs. And you can see he had three females come and visit him here at this, this particular tree. And each one of those lines is a female making her, her galleries and laying the eggs. Um, they typically have a tuning fork appearance if there's three. If there's four, it looks like you know, two U's put together. If it's just two, it's just be typically just one line. But usually it's three. And like the western pine beetle, they typically have three generations per year. So their populations, when the conditions are right, can really explode and kill a lot of trees. And then there's another, <clears throat> and normally um, these beetles just hang out in tops of trees. If you'll see, be driving down the road and you see a ponderosa pine and just the top's dead, well, that's typically done by these Ips beetles and that's how they stay kind of in the forest during the normal seasons when you know, the trees are healthy. They usually find the one that's just kind of marginally unhealthy and they'll just take out the top of the tree. Now we have another beetle here that is uh, in our area. It's called a round-headed pine beetle. And it's got a totally different lifestyle. See, it's got S-shaped galleries that kind of go up and down the tree. And you can barely see it, but the larvae actually feed in the phloem tissue of this particular species. You can kind of see their little larval galleries. Uh, what's good about this beetle, it only has one generation per year. And so it's a little easier to manage for and it doesn't cause quite as much damage. And it's also unusual is that their flight period is in the fall, like October, November. They probably have done, just now done their flights. So this is what the forest around Dolo looks like now. A lot of dead trees. We just uh, we do aerial detection surveys. Uh, the Forest Service does, and um, we usually fly from the middle of July to about the end of August, and cover the whole state, all the forests and all the Sky Islands in the state. And I had the opportunity to go along with them this year and um, do all the state. It was very interesting. And um, when we flew this area, I was like latter part of July, 1st of August, there was a tree here, a tree there, a couple of trees over there, not looking too bad. And we thought, well, good, maybe this is not going to be as bad as we thought. And as time went by and I came up here visiting uh, some people and I may have made several trips, I noticed that uh, just driving along the road that there's just more and more and more dead trees. So that was those second and third generations kicking in that we didn't pick up in the original flight. So we talked about it at the Forest Service and they decided to do a supplemental flight, very unusual. So we did another flight in October and this is what we found. 
And the results of that is that the populations of dead trees due to the bark beetles has quadrupled since the end of July and 1st of August, at least showing up on the landscape. So this is, these, are, these are actual pictures. Just uh, This, I think, is down on White River, but the other three were right around Sholo here. So there's a lot of dead trees out there. Uh, another concern is the pinyon ips, and it is specific to pinyon pine. And uh, it also just acts like the ponderosa pine ip species. You know, it creates, the, ma the male creates a, a nuptial chamber and the females feed out from there. And um, that effect, affected acreage has increased almost quadruple too since August in, the, in those trees. Uh, junipers, um, they're usually a very, very hardy plant. We usually do, do don't see very much mortality in juniper. They're very drought resistant. But this year, we started seeing uh, large, large patches of dead junipers. And it, upon investigation, it's caused by the cedar bark beetle. And it's usually very rare to find that beetle until this year. And we're finding it in uh, junipers in Arizona Cypress. I had a gentleman over by Cornville. Um, he had his house surrounded with Arizona Cypress. And he called me, he says, I think there's something wrong with my trees. And I go there, and every one of them was infested. Hundreds of trees that he had around surrounding his house was infested with this bark beetle. And he's going to have to remove them all and replace them with something else. And they have a very distinctive gallery. Um, it's usually just one uh, line. But the, the larvae really etched deeply into the tissue. So it's very easy to, to see that. And they can cause widespread mortality like they have this year during extreme drought. Okay, now what caused this outbreak of bark beetles uh, and tree mortality? I think we all probably know by now it was this extreme drought that we had. Now this was taken, this was the drought map of May 29th. And you can see Sholo and actually most of the mortality is between Sholo and Heber Obergard in this area here. But if you follow right down that, that really dark strip where it was, it's called an exceptional drought, that's where we've had most of the mortality. We flew the whole forest, and when we were over on the western side of Coconino and the Kaibab, we were flying around and going, well, there's no mortality here. There was very, very little dead trees. And we kind of scratched our heads, well, why is this so bad over by Hebrew Overguard, but not here? Now, I looked at the map, well, there's a big difference in how much moisture they got there as compared to here. And so the bark beetles just didn't have an opportunity to get going. The trees were a little healthier over there, which is good. Now, what do you do when you have bark beetles in your trees? Well, we call that suppression. Because now you got, we have a problem. And the best thing we can do that we advise to do, it's called sanitation, is to destroy the trees while the beetles are still in them. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Let's get them while they're in the tree, get all those trees destroyed, we kill the beetles, and we knock the populations down. And it works pretty good. Uh, ways to do that, uh, you can pile and burn, except when, you know, springtime is usually really dry and you're not allowed to burn. So that option was out this year for a long time. And another option is to um, haul, the, haul the material off to a burn pit, which fortunately there is a burn pit near here, and there was one around Happy Jack. Happy Jack also had a big outbreak of the beetles there too, and uh, that tinder fire didn't help. Uh, that kind of got the beetles going also along with the drought. Another thing you can do is you can chip all the material. Uh, Believe it or not, in California, when I worked with this tree service during the, the drought there, some of the customers just wanted us to chip up their trees. So we brought in big chippers and we chip, chipped up these humongous ponderosa pines and left a big pile of chips and they used it for um, a mulch. Uh, if you can't get rid of the trees, you can't destroy the trees, one option, it's not the best, is to 
stack the infested material kind of out in the open if you can in the sunny area and cover it real tightly with clear plastic. What that does, it does kind of cook the beetles, especially in the larval stage. They're kind of, you know, a little bit sensitive and it gets real hot and it'll also get drier and they just can't complete their development sometimes. And some of them will come out, some of them will chew through the plastic, but you won't get that big explosion out of the tree if you hadn't covered it. So how do you know if you still have beetles in the tree? Now that's a big question that a lot of people have asked because it's become a kind of a hot issue. Do I need to cut this tree down now or can I wait till later? Do I have to destroy this tree or not? Well, if the beetles have already gone, you've got all the time in the world, you've got several years before that tree is going to fall down typically. Um, not all, you know, we can't guarantee when, how long they will stand, but they can also be used as firewood. So, you know, the emergency part of, you know, getting the tree taken care of is no longer an issue. And you can see by, it's like somebody hit that tree with uh, a shotgun. There's a really small holes and that's where the beetles came out. Now, winter is a really good time to get on top of this problem right now and until next spring when they start to fly again if the whole community kind of comes together and gets rid of the infested trees with the bark beetles in them well at least this area here will have a much better chance next spring if we have another dry season another drought uh, kind of all the cards are off the table but we're hoping we will get at least a moderate winter um, and if we do uh, the areas that have been treated stand a really good chance of being successful. Here's an example. Uh, this is California. This is Yosemite Valley. And you see the picture on the left is a major campground in the valley. And I took the picture from Glacier Point. And there are several spots here. These are all western pine beetle infested ponderosa pine. And you can see in the center is the really brown trees. Those are the ones, those were the initial trees that got attacked, and now the next generations had been coming out, and the, the spots are getting bigger. And I thought, oh goodness, here goes the whole campground, here goes the whole valley, the way it felt like. And this is, you know, millions and millions of people come here for the forest and for the water. It absorbed the water and the nutrients, so it kind of just helps water itself when there's natural rain. So you, as a homeowner, uh, only, only you need to do it about every three to four weeks. And it's given a really good soaking at that drip line uh, overnight with a soaker hose or something like that. And that will be sufficient enough to give that tree a really good chance of survival. Um, we have been working with pheromones, and this is that verbenone pheromone that I mentioned earlier. It has somewhat of a good effect with some of the dendrochna species. Here in the West, especially mountain pine beetle, which has killed millions of acres of lodgepole pine and other pines, and uh, is, a, is a very uh, small problem here in this state. But uh, verbenone is not effective for Western pine beetle. I spent eight years in the research branch of the Forest Service trying to augment verbenone as a tree protectant that we could give to the public put on your tree and keep the beetles away. This is that signal that says the house is full. And man, we threw the, threw the book at them and the Western pine beetle is just a very difficult beetle to work with. Now we don't know if the Ips species are sensitive to this chemical or not. There was one test done up in British Columbia, Canada, where they tested uh, the verbenone uh, with the Ips species up there. And they had a moderate amount of, of success but that's been like 10, 20 years ago. So we put in a grant, Monica and I, to try a trapping bioassay down here using verbenone with the Ips beetles. And we're going to, with attractants, to bring them in and see if that repellent will tell them to go away and not come to our traps. Well, we got a grant uh, application in, and we'll see if we get funded or not. And then there's always insecticide. Um, and there's a couple ways that you can treat your tree with insecticides. One is called bowl sprays, where the applicator comes up with a high, takes specialized equipment, 
and this is the specialized equipment, um, to have a pump powerful enough to spray that tree all the way up, and you really have to soak the tree. Uh, two of the main chemicals that are used for bowl sprays is permethrin and carbaryl. Permethrin is not as strong as carbaryl. Uh, you may have to treat your tree at least once a year and probably twice a year with permethrin. This is what I used. I didn't, but my company used in California, and I didn't have very much success with it. But carbaryl has been the go-to standard for decades. It has been very effective. And as you can see, uh, you really have to soak tree, soak it hard to really give it the protection it needs. But there's one little problem with this. As you can see at the top of that picture, there's kind of this mist. Well, that's the drift. That's the stuff that doesn't get on the tree. So we did a study when I was with the Forest Service about, well, what are the environmental impacts uh, from spraying trees with carbaryl? And this, this, is, this diagram I made, um, the inner circle is 25 feet from the tree, the next circle is 50, the 75 feet, and then the large one on the outside is 125 feet from the tree. The deposition of carbaryl at 125 feet was still strong enough to kill bees. Bees are very sensitive to this chemical. So 125 feet from that tree you're spraying, you can kill bees, let alone everything in between that's in the ground. Um, even at 75 feet, the uh, reason we did this is that how close to a water body can we spray? Well, at 75 feet, you can still kill aquatic insects and rainbow trout fry. So it can still be very, very toxic, even at 75 feet. So if you've got 40 trees on your property and you spray 40 trees, you're putting a lot of insecticide on the ground. But you know, it's better than losing all your trees as long as you're not you know, damaging the environment. You know, if there's a real sensitive area with a lot of bees or if you're close to a water body. Now, bowl injections, uh, trunk injections is something I've done over 200 trees myself personally. Uh, I was involved with the original research. You know, we were all pretty skeptical about uh, it, injections that you know, none of this stuff works. Ace caps, we, those have been tried, that didn't work. Uh, as one of the things I had earlier was uh, ground injections where you, you put insecticide in the ground and it, and it soaks up to the roots. We didn't have any success with that, but we did have success with this imamectin benzoate and it goes by the trade name Triage, and it's the only one on the market, unfortunately. And the way you do it, you drill a hole in the tree, you put a plug in it, and then you put a pressurized needle in it, then you open the pressure up, and it pushes the insecticide into the, right into the xylem tissue, and then the, it's, that's the water transport part of the tree. So it will take that insecticide up and then spread it throughout the tree. It takes about four weeks. So you'd like to do that, now would be a good time to do it. Um, and one thing about the bowl sprays, there's nobody in Arizona that I know of that has the equipment and the uh, expertise to do it yet. Uh, we're working on getting some people trained up to do it. But so far, I haven't found an applicator that knows how to do this. And I haven't finished calling all of them. But uh, if I get that information, I'll pass it along to um, the Forest Service and our extension agents through the um, U University of Arizona and they'll get that information to you. But there is a, a, one operator in Phoenix that does this work, and he does, will come up here and do several trees. It's kind of expensive. Uh, one little liter bottle for me as an applicator when I did it cost $520. And it, it's just ridiculous. And that is enough to treat maybe 10 trees. So you can see it's, it's very expensive. And then there's the time involved, and then you gotta buy the, the, the caps and all the equipment to do it. Uh, it's an expensive project. Well, one of the main things we really push for, and I mentioned earlier, is thinning. Now that gives the trees the optimal chance to be healthy, to you know, absorb the, the water and nutrients it needs. Even in, even in low years, if you got them you know, very spaced very good, it's enough to get them by. And see the picture on the left there is a very, very dense stand. We have a lot of that here in Arizona. 100 years ago, there was a, an exceptional crop of honorosapine uh, seedlings. And we're seeing the results of that. A lot of even these small trees are 100 years old. 
and some of the big ones are too. But we have dense stands like that throughout Arizona in the Ponderosa Pine Forest. What we want them to look like is this picture on the right. That's more historic, much more open. You notice there's not much on the ground because we used to have frequent fires that would take care of the fuel on the ground. I noticed they're burning all over the place around here today, taking care of some of those fuels. Uh, there's one problem with this, though, is when you do it, you're going to create what we call slash. So we have to be real careful about slash management when you do these kind of treatments during the period of time the beetles are active. Because these Ips beetles, like anything that's three inches or larger, that's prime habitat for them. And they're very, very attracted to the monoterpenes that are put out when you cut down the tree and cut the limbs off and cut things up. Well, you're putting those, those odors in the air, and the Ips beetles are very, very attracted to that. So if you have the slash, you do, you do your treatments with the tree, you destroy the tree. If you still got the limbs left over, burn them, chip them, or take them to the, uh, the pit and have them destroyed. But if you do the treatments in late fall and winter, uh, it's not so much of an issue because you have time now for the, that material to dry out and it doesn't become as suitable uh, host for the beetles for one, and then the odors of the fresh cut pine are now gone too. So you're not really attracting the beetles into your area. Well, the best time to do these treatments is the winter. So now's the time to get on top of the problem. And with that, I'd like to talk about an opportunity that you have with uh, the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. We, we uh, have a grant that we oversee, and it's called the Western Bark Beetle Initiative. And what we do, the purpose of the grant is to reduce tree densities through thinning and to improve forest-resistant trees to bark beetles. So it, in other words, let's make them healthy. Let's, you know, let's clear out all that stuff. And so we have a grant, and we provide a 50-50 match. So, and it's available to uh, units of government, local government, cities and towns, counties can apply for this grant. And it's, a lot of times it's done through the, um, the fire departments will be get heavily involved in, in getting the, uh, the projects on the ground. Um, nonprofit organizations, 501c3s, a lot of the homeowner associations, I believe, are 5013c's or c3s, and they're eligible also if you have areas on your property that are too dense and need thinning. Apply for the grant. And we also do it for uh, public educational institutions. They're also eligible. So this is a great opportunity, one, to get you know, the trees destroyed. Um, and, and then we have this opportunity to help you improve the health of the forest that still remains. Mm -hmm.